Hello, and welcome everyone. My name is Deep Tran. I'm an arts journalist and critic, and thank you all so much for joining us for tonight's event, uh, Asian Imagination, How Art and Theater Can Combat AAPI Violence. Uh, we'd like to start the event with a land acknowledgement. The Pershing, Square, the Pershing Square Signature Center sits on occupied territory no, known as the Lenape Coig, the land of the the land of the Lenape people who are still here to, here today. Um, while land acknowledgement is not enough, it's a, it is an important reminder and a way to contemplate the land on which we sit. I am thrilled to be joined tonight by three fantastic panelists. Uh, first is David Henry Huang, who is a signature residency one playwright from 20, 2012 to 2014. His work includes the plays Soft Power and Butterfly, Chinglish, Yellowface, and FOB, as well as the Broadway musicals Aida, Tarzan, and the 2002 revival of Flower Drum Song. He is a Tony Award winner, a Grammy Award winner, and a three-time finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. Our second panelist is Lauren Yi, who is the second most produced playwright in America for the 2019-2020 season and is currently a residency five playwright at the Signature. Her first play in the residency, Cambodian Rock Band, had its New York premiere at the Signature in 2020. She is the winner of the Doris Duke Artist Award, the Steinberg Playwright Award, the, Hor the Horton Foot Prize, and the, Acad and the American Academy of Arts and Letters Literature Award. Che Yu, our final panelist, is an acclaimed playwright and director who has worked at theaters across the country. He has directed the world premiere of Lauren's play, Cambodian Rock Band, along with its New York City premiere at The Signature. He is the recipient of an Obie Award for Direction, and from 2011 to 2020, he was the artistic director of Victory Gardens Theater in Chicago. And just so everyone knows, we will end the night by fielding a few live questions from all of you watching. So you can submit the questions at any time using the Q&A feature in your Zoom window. But before we get to our panelists, we'd like to show some excerpts from David and Lauren's plays. These were recorded over the last week with three fantastic actors who played these roles in the recent New York premiere of the plays. The first scene is from Cambodian Rock Band, performed by Joe Ngo and Courtney Reed. The second scene is a mashup of monologues from David's latest work, Soft Power, perform performed by Francis Ju. Enjoy, and we'll see you afterwards for the conversation. I can't go back out there. You stay in here, the tourist's gonna come in and think you part of the museum, and work is gonna fire you. They're already gonna fire me. I broke into S21. Ah, we just say sorry, stupid American. That's what I feel like all the time, stupid American. Better than a sad Cambodian. I can't go back out there. I can't do that press conference. Why not? I don't know how to work on this case anymore. I don't know how to be neutral. I used to see pictures of Doik in the paper. I used to see him reading books, playing chess, holding court, speaking French. I used to see him stirring sugar into his tea, looking out the window and think, huh, how strange. But ever since I found your photo, I see him and I feel such rage. I wanna take away his window take away his tea. I want to see him bruised, battered, chained to the floor, smashed against a tree. I want to slit his throat over the noise of a generator. I want to do everything to him that was done to you and everyone else at S21. I want to grind him to dust. I say I want justice, but that's bullshit. I don't want justice. I want revenge for something I didn't even experience because I'm just a stupid American. If you feel that, that's on me. I didn't even know you liked music. You never came to any of my recitals. When I left Cambodia, I couldn't listen to the music no more. Couldn't hear it in this ear. Didn't want to hear it in that one. 
Did you ever tell mom any of this? About the band? About what happened here? No, but she knows. How? You Cambodian, you just know. Then why don't I just know? Because I raised you not to. Because I was afraid. Of what? You know why I stopped taking you to see the Sox? Because they were never going to win the World Series. Yes. And we get to the seventh inning stretch and you got to go. So I take you to the ladies' room, try to go in after you. And mom says, you can't go in there. She's nine years old. You got to let her go by herself. And I say, D, what if she don't come out? What if I lose her? That's not going to happen. D, you don't know. All my life, I lose people. All my life, they go. I think you'll see me for who I was. What I still am. You're not going to want me no more. And I think to myself, wow, that is the worst thing that could happen. But I was wrong. Real worst thing. Not I lose you. But you lose yourself. One last trade, okay? One last thing about how I leave this place and you decide you still want me. You escaped. Yes. What else is there? Am I even going to be able to live in this country anymore? Almost half the population just voted for a guy who thinks we don't really belong here. That we should be nothing more than supporting characters in someone else's story. It's like when I was a kid. This country had been at war with Japan, Korea, Vietnam, and China was our big enemy. So, all the Asians in shows were only ever supporting characters. Bad guys, sexy women, or jokes and they never belonged in America. Whenever I saw a face like mine, I braced myself because I knew something terrible was gonna... I hear myself yelling, what the fuck? My whole head, it's ringing. What happened? Ow. I slam into a wall. The street is spinning. I hit a parked car. The sidewalk, like, waves. Do I have a concussion? I'm... Bleeding, stabbed in the neck. What the fuck? I'm gonna die. No, get to the hospital. Just two blocks away. I can't walk. Wait, Boy Scouts, put pressure on a wound. Step, step, I'm walking straight. I can do this. Just two blocks away. Don't look back, just keep going. What's that sound? Blood in my shoes. Cross to Calb Avenue, reaching Brooklyn Hospital. I'm gonna faint now and then, in the moment before I lose consciousness, a whole world passes before my eyes. My attacker had severed my vertebral artery, making me lose about a third of my blood. I should have bled out, or at least suffered a stroke. And my crime remains unsolved. The best police theory is not so different from what happened in my dream, that I was targeted because of my appearance. My assailant mistook me for an Asian delivery person, then ran away when I yelled, what the fuck, in unaccented English, and left me to die. All my life, I've been waiting for this to happen. 
All my life I've walked down streets where people have assumed I don't belong. All my life I've feared I was marked for something terrible because of this face. And now it's finally happened. And when the worst thing in the world actually happens, but you somehow survive, you feel, at least for a moment, like you can do anything. So I wrote this show. There's a saying, Da nam bu si, bi you hou fu. Good fortune will follow if we somehow survive. Mm. Yes. Oh my goodness. And I, I, I wish we were doing this live so we can apply right. for that. Yeah. And, and Francis Ju, of course, is a major part of Cambodian rock band also. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so much of Asian American theater wouldn't uh, exist without Francis yeah. Ju. Yeah. yeah, like he and Sima are, are like Asian America's favorite dads. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But for, oh, and uh, for, for any of you, anyone who hasn't seen either of those plays, uh, they do have cast albums where you can listen to the music from them. Mm -hmm. So please buy them, stream them. You know, give these artists some money. Okay. Oh, and before we start our panel, I just wanted to acknowledge that uh, our, our panelists are speaking from their own personal experience. They do not speak for all of Asian America, especially because we only have East Asian and Southeast Asian rep representation here. So, so we want to acknowledge the uh, oversight there. Um, but first off, since we just watched that excerpt from Soft Power, David, um, I think we should say that that monologue was inspired by something that actually happened to you. Like someone did s slice your neck in, while you were walking home to, in Brooklyn. And you've talked about how like you felt shame initially to even talk about it because the police, the NYPD didn't even categorize it as a hate crime. And, and Che, you've also talked about the racist incidents that have happened to you and how you felt shame around talking about that. And I think that's a very common feeling within Asian America. And so can you both talk about like, where do you think that shame comes from? Um, so yeah, I, um, uh, I was um, stabbed in the neck and um, sort of have come to refer to myself as um, an OG AAPI hate attack survivor um, because it happened, you know, a few years ago. Um, but it, it reinforces the notion that um, anti-Asian hate is certainly nothing new. And there's lots of ways to talk about how um, it, we can trace it uh, back to the beginning of uh, Asian Americans being in this country in the mid 19th century. Um, but the, the shame is interesting because in a way it's a little counterintuitive. Like you think the, theoretically the person who commits the crime should be ashamed. Um, and even though at the time that I was stabbed, uh, Assemblyman Ron Kim from Queens called a press conference to denounce anti-Asian hate and attacks. And I wasn't really ready to be part of that yet. Um, and I think that working on soft power was a way for me to accept um, what had happened to me to process it. Um, and I give a lot of credit to uh, composer Janine Tesori and director Lee Silverman. They were really pushing me to um, take what happened to my character in the show seriously. And then subsequently, uh, particularly after Georgia and the massacre there and realizing that the police never want to call anything a hate crime. Um, I've become much more comfortable with saying that happened to me and feeling it's important because we all need to share these experiences that we don't want to talk about. Because, and I think we feel shame because we're like, oh, it just happened to me. Like I did something wrong. Um, but the more we hear about the stories, we realize it's not, doesn't have anything to do with us except we have these faces and America is racist. Mm -hmm. 
Um, from my point of view, uh, probably as an immigrant, I mean, I was brought up traditionally by saying, having parents saying, you know, you have to endure, you know, you have to eat bitter, to chirku, you know, to keep quiet, don't call attention to yourself. And in a way, that is perversely what they think is of a strength to actually hunker down, don't, everything will pass. If you survive this, there's strength. And we're also never taught to actually say what is shameful. So we want to hide behind it because it's meant losing face. And if bad things happen, don't talk about it. And I think all this lumped into the fact of, hey, you are an unofficial diplomat of the entire Chinese race. Mm. So every time you do something wrong, the community is shamed. And it's a huge burden. And I have to say that even though there are wonderful things, probably to be mined from the things that I was taught, we ultimately have to speak out and speak up. We have to take up space. We have to act. I think this is what this country has given us. And then the more that we try to bridge or find, I think, a wonderful intersection, the more we can actually have a piece of this country for ourselves as well with everyone else. I think it's more cultural from my, from my standpoint. And I actually agree with what David said. Yeah, I, I'm so glad you brought up, Che, you brought up the whole uh, having to be a diplomat for China, because I think we can all, we can trace where the most recent spate of hate crimes came from, which is a former president characterizing COVID-19 as a Kung flu virus, which which kind of brings to mind when Chinese immigrants first came to America, they were, they were called like Har harbingers of disease and disease ridden bringing plague to America, even though ironically, um, it was the settlers that brought the first plague to America and actually killed a lot of people. And, and so, and I feel like all of you have talked about like the role of, of China within your art. And so like, like, well, we'll start big tonight and then go, go smaller into theater, but like the so like, does our discourse, our current discourse around China as being like a combative opponent to America, like, do you think that's also damaging right now? Mm. Well, aren't you? <laughs> I mean, it, I mean, I, it, feel, it feels like all of our face, all of our faces said yes, um, that it, that it is damaging. And I was, and I was trying to like locate, uh, Exact exactly why that is. Um. I mean, I I would argue that the tricky thing about being Asian American, or um, uh, and specifically in this case, if we're talking about China, Chinese American, but it applies to all Asians, um, is that because of the perpetual foreigner stereotype, um, the way we are regarded in this country is always a function of the United States relationship with some Asian country. And whenever there's tension, um, it, uh, we, we get targeted. Um, so I think the long, you know, we don't want to say that China's perfect either. We don't, you know, there are definitely legitimate things to criticize about China. So the question for me becomes, how do we decouple that? How do we um, make it such that the, for, the perpetual foreigner stereotype goes away. And therefore, we're able to critique um, these Asian nations without it then redounding on um, attacks on us. I think I, I, I heard it in a quote recently um, about, about kind of like, with when you're the majority population, you are judged on the best, the best, the best of, of your kind. But when you're kind of in this in this minority group, it's usually like the work the worst, like whatever the worst is associated with that group is who you are. And so I feel as like Asian Americans, um, even though I feel like Asian America is like a coalition of of many different groups rather rather than like you know uh, one category, we we are all judged together based based on kind of how we look. Um, and that it's it's true when something happens in the news and and the person kind of looks like you, you're like, oh, you're like, oh God, um, how is how is this gonna affect us? I also say that the larger point of this too is that it, this is not new. Dehumanizing the other to cast blame has always been a 
tactic and a strategy of many governments and regimes. The Nazis did this to the Jews. The Israeli government has done this to the Palestinians, the Serbs, the Bosnians. Even the Americans have done this to the Blacks, Mexicans, Arabs, Japanese Americans, and now Chinese. The question is, what are we going to do about this? Who's going to be next? Who's going to get beat next? I think this combative rhetoric, um, rhetoric around China will have resonance because it's part of the economics, it's a, it's a power grab, and to find a common enemy is what most regimes do. I will say, today it's us. Tomorrow will be someone else. And this has to stop now. Oh, Deep, I think you're muted. Yes, it's not a Zoom panel unless that happens. Okay, yeah, and like twenty and twenty years ago, and it was Muslims and and South Asians who 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 were the targets. So it seems like all of these things just come in cycles, and I feel like the connection between all of that is, like the positioning and like this is like a very colonial mentality mentality that the U.S. has, the positioning of any foreign body, any brown foreign body as a, as a dangerous body. And today it is like, you know, 10, 20 years ago, it was the Muslim body. And today it is the, the Asian, the Asian body. And so like, how do, and, and I, and, but, but then that, that's why I love like Cambodian rock band so much actually, because it is about Cambodians in Cambodia talking specifically about what they what they have gone through in their history without using whiteness as like the point of entry. And so like Lauren when you when you and Che when you both were working on that play like were the conversations around like how do we make sure like these people aren't seen as other? Mm. Yeah. I mean I I think it's it's for me it's it's partially I think like centering the story on the people it's about. Um, I think like, I, I always like to imagine when I'm writing, like who is the, who is like the single audience member I'd like to reach? Like obviously every, like everyone should go see the show. Um, but like in my mind, who is the person I am like building this for? Uh, so that like, it kind of guides the choices that you make and lets you know whether you got it right or wrong. Because you can do a production and 10 different people can tell you like, you got it right or you got it wrong. So it's like, it's, it's, a, it's always hard to know. Um, and, I, and I think for me, the person that I have in mind, you know, for Cambodian rock band is like a second generation Cambodian American. So like born, born and raised, say in Long Beach, who may kind of know this music growing up, but maybe doesn't know the whole history. And so just like holding that at the center, I think just informs so many more choices. Um, you know, that it would be a different play if I was like, it, this is actually a play for a Cambodian who like lives in Phnom Penh and just has a very different uh, cultural reference point. I agree with Lauren and I'll just, probably just add that um, being Asian American is complicated because it's just not one thing or one country. There are many, many different countries, many, many different provinces, many different, many, many different tribes and also languages. And it's hard to always encapsulate that. And what the beauty of this community we have too is that it's all in this country and we have yet to see many of these stories and we need to see more of them because these are the American narrative and I think, most importantly, stories about immigrants who have come to this country. I always feel, you know, when, when you take the train or you take the bus and they, you see all these people in the streets and you just don't know where they come from. They're delivering food or they're rushing off to something. But these are migrants, immigrants. They, these are also people who have come from a horrible regime to start a new life in this country. And these stories are never heard. And when these stories are not heard, at some point, we are not heard. So I think to some extent, the Cambodian rock band has opened a door into looking at Cambodian Americans. And I hope there's gonna be more of stories about us on our stages and in the media in the near future. Yeah, I think especially with the, um, with the massacre in Georgia and it, was, and it was targeted towards low income workers who don't have power. And, and I, I think like sometimes we like, I think we as you know, 
it, it, like second, second, third generation Asian Americans kind of forget the precarious conditions that mm -hmm. first generations or like people who, or new immigrants have. And, and so like, that's what I really loved about Cambodian rock band actually was because like Lauren, like you played with a with the, with a common stereotype, which is like an Asian immigrant. Asian immigrant man who speaks with an accent and mm -hmm. then you invert it like halfway through the play and so and so audiences I feel like have to relate like mm -hmm. they like there's there's going to be no explaining here and I, and I find that like so refreshing when it comes to you know, like portrayals of Asians on stage yeah and, and I think like that that shift in particular when we go back to the past and we get to know this man as a younger man it's, it's kind of like everything that his daughter isn't able to see, right? Because she like literally was not alive then and just didn't have access, access to growing up. Um, and, you know, and, and I think it's like always like very exciting to like see that, see that shift when he goes back, back in time and you're like totally in his perspective. Um, and I feel like that this is a very basic question for all of you, but since a soft power monologue talked about Asian stereotypes on stage, can we talk about Asian stereotypes on stage? Because I, and how it's related to real life Asian violence. Because I feel like when, I feel like the phrase representation matters has become kind of diluted and no one really knows what it means. And so, you know, what does that mean to you right now? Um. So representation matters because invisibility is death. Um, you know, there is this survey that a lot of us are familiar with that came out, I think, last week, where um, Americans were asked to name a well-known Asian American. And 40% of them could not come up with a single name. And of those who did name someone, the most common person name was Bruce Lee, who Bruce Lee's great, but he passed away about 50 years ago. Uh, and the second one name was Jackie Chan, who's not an American, of course. So when we are invisible, it means that we're not really there. We're not really human. And if we're not human, it's easier to objectify us. It's easier to hate us. It's easier to attack and kill us. Um, and this the, the Georgia massacre and the guy saying, oh, I wasn't racist. I was, you know, I was a sex addict is such a prime example of the intersectionality of, um, of stereotypes about Asian women and the hypersexualization of Asian women, which one, you know, of course I'm going to feel because I wrote a play dissecting Madam Butterfly, I'm going to feel that a, another Broadway musical that also is based on Madam Butterfly uh, encourages that point of view, but it's probably more nuanced than that. Oh, you, you can say it. We, 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 all, we all think it. <laughs> uh, Deep, you wrote a whole piece on it. <laughs> yeah, were you on mute, Che? Were you on mute? Yes, I said Miss Saigon. <laughs> Miss Saigon, Miss Saigon, be gone. Yeah, I think um, piggybacking on what David said too, you know, I think aside from invisibility, there's also stereotypes on stage and in the media that is, um, I think, very, very damaging to us. You, we have the, the gang, so the dragon lady, the hooker, the feminine assistant, but this is how the world sees us. And what I fear sometimes is how Asian Americans see ourselves. And this gives us a complex that we should be that way or we're always trying to get out of that. And we're always in a constant battle. So in the larger picture of this, I, we have to say moving forward, who is writing this and who is producing this? Mm -hmm. How can we find a way to create more nuanced, complex, truthful characters? Mm -hmm. We need to see more of these characters in our stories. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think David, you can also talk about the King and I because like, soft power is a lampoon of the king and I, and it's a colonial, colonialist uh, lens. Yeah, so, okay, we can talk about king and I too. Um, <laughs> look, I mean, there's fantastic things about the king and I, and it's beautifully written. Um, 
And I've always liked it a lot until, um, you know, I most recently when I saw the revival, which was a fantastically done revival, I was like, oh, wow, there's some things that are really troubling about this, like, you know, the premise. Mm -hmm. It's basically about a white woman who goes to Siam to teach the king how to bring his people into the family of nations. Um, and so it's fascinating the, the degree to which something which we don't necessarily think of as having, as being a political piece, um, once you start to look at it, yeah, there's a political message that's embedded in that. And it's a white supremacist message. Mm -hmm. um, so how do we look at these works or is there a way to approach them or reinterpret them or direct them in a different way such that we can appreciate what's good about them um, and also uh, critique the stuff that's just not true. And basically the source material is actually not truthful. I mean, it was a, a novel, I mean, a so-called testimonial story written by this English woman who's actually not even a tutor. So this has perpetuated lots of movies, mm -hmm. even with Jodie Foster and Chow Yun-Fat in it, and also on Broadway. So year after year, we bring out this story. Mm -hmm. This is how the world sees us. I would go one step, I'm sorry, I just, I just wanna say one more thing about Anna Leon yeah. Owens, the real Anna. Not only was she, she uh, did she rep misrepresent her job, she wasn't actually even white. She was a mixed race South Asian woman who tried to pass for white her entire life. And even after her death, that myth perpetuated. And, and I think, you know, like if she, if she had accurately portrayed herself, would the king and I be the king and I, right? If, if it was actually the story of two people of Asian descent, uh, you know, and, and their relationship, Prob probably not. So I think I tweeted about this, about how I wish someone would cast like an Indian, Indian American actress to play Anna in any production of The King and I. I think that would be a really, that will take out some of that. Like, I think I think I think Rick Shiomi did a production yeah. uh, 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 that did just that in Minneapolis, maybe five or 10 years ago. Yeah. Yeah, bring that to Broadway. Uh, or, or not actually produce soft power Cambodian rock band. Why, why are we doing these old musicals by dead people? Um, uh, che, you, you just brought up something really crucial, I think, which is like these portrayals like affect how Asian Asians see ourselves. And so like for all of you as creators, like how have you fought against the invisibility stereotype? Well, I, I think Speaking as a, as a once producer, you know, you start programming plays about Asian American stories and narratives, which are written in a more nuanced, as I said, complex way and not stereotypical. And I think as a director, you just choose certain plays that you want to do that you feel have never been seen before about different communities of Asian American. I always love Asian American politics. I mean, I wish there were more plays about that too, but I think all these kinds of plays are important. And even as a playwright, you know, my question is always about how we live. I think we have to keep promoting our community of artists and um, Asian Americans to write and tell greater and better stories. I, there's, there's a lot of us out there writing. And I think the problem here is there are not enough homes. And that's why I look at producers and, and artistic directors and ask, why not? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I think like, you know, just like when Crazy Rich Asians came out and I feel like, you know, the financial success of that opened so many doors for other projects, but also at the same time, I think there was this like intense pressure on it for it to represent all of Asians and Asian America and all, and you know, even all of Singapore that people were like, Singapore is so much more uh, than, than kind of crazy rich Asians, which is true. Um, but it's like, that's, that's, that's the pressures when, when, when you just hold up the one story. I was like, I, you, you just want to open the floodgates and see all of it, you know? Yeah, I'm old enough to, um, I mean, I, I, I tend to say that one generation's breakthroughs are the next generation's stereotypes. 
mm -hmm. uh, because I'm old enough to remember when Bruce Lee first became known in America. And, you know, he created, it's extraordinary, he created an entire new trope that had never existed before, the sort of Asian male action hero. And that was a huge breakthrough. And five or 10 years later, everyone in America thinks that all Asians do Kung Fu. Yeah. Um, and the, that is not the fault of any artist or any representation or any story. It's the fault of not having mm -hmm. a range of stories that represents us with the heterogeneity that we actually mm -hmm. possess. And so it's fantastic. At this moment, there are so many wonderful young Asian American writers. Um, and hopefully if our theaters give these shows homes and these stories are also done you know, in film and television, then we will begin to achieve that range of diversity within our community. And I want to just add that this may be an interesting example. I just didn't realize this until David said that. I mean, all three of us are linked in a very weird way to what you just said deep. I first met David and he may have forgotten. It was basically, he was having his M Butterfly tour in Boston. And I uh, approached him at the end of the show and said hello because we had friends in common in Singapore. And at the time I was writing and it was all white, always was a white play. But when I saw M Butterfly, it made me felt like we were visible. We had to have stories that we need to be told and that inspired me. Mm -hmm. And in a weird, beautiful way from being a playwright to a director, working with Lauren and also an artistic director, I produced Lauren's plays at uh, Victory Gardens. So to some extent, the beauty of this thing is that there is a continuity. If we keep feeding the community, keep inspiring the community to keep writing, creating, and to tell those stories. I think three of us here are an example that could be replicated more so in the Asian American creative community. Yeah. and if. Um... If I'm correct, I feel like we are all a product of like the Asian American theaters that like, at least for me, and I think maybe for one or both of you, just like a lot of the yeses that came early on came came from places like Asian American Theater Company or Theater Moo um, that were that were kind of like attuned to finding that work and and really training the community, like if you're if you're talking about kind of Asian American theater in Minneapolis, like Rick Shiomi is the guy who's like, you know, would would go around restaurants being like, you, have you ever considered being an, an actor? Uh, and and just like really built that pipeline that exists today, you know, because like we can't we can't do our work as writers or directors, you know, if if there are not the people to populate these these worlds. And going back even further in history, when I was a kid and growing up in LA, my mom was the rehearsal pianist for one of the first productions at East West Players, um, directed by Mako. And I hung around rehearsals at 10 years old and then didn't think much about theater for many years. But when I got to college and I started thinking, oh, maybe I can write some plays, maybe I was influenced by the fact that as a kid, I saw people who looked like me as actors, as directors, as artistic leaders. And that was imprinted on me and made me think it was possible. And now that theater is named after you, David. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, there's that too. <laughs> <laughs> yes, if anyone ever goes to Los Angeles, please visit East West Players at the David Henry Hong Theater. <laughs> I'm done embarrassing you for tonight. Uh, uh, Lauren, actually, I, 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 I want to bring up something that you told me privately, and I think it goes back to this conversation we're having about, um, about, about empowerment, which is, which is like, you told me that you, um, you consciously wrote big plays. So yeah. that pe so that producers would put them in bigger spaces, so that you'd get get more visibility. And I feel that like that's connected to Che, who became a director, which is like the a director and producer, which is like the biggest seats of powers in the in the American theater. And so, can the two of you talk about like like ha how you empower yourselves, so that you're not waiting for other people? Yeah, go Che, go. 
I will just say this, theater is hard because it takes a village, it literally does. But that doesn't mean that you have to wait for a seat at the table to be invited to be part of that. If you can't build your own table, create your own theater company, East West came out of the need to express itself. So did the public theater. And all these big New York theaters we all are dying to be part of, used to start at storefronts. And they are now becoming, just they've become big institutions. So I'm just saying that we can tell our own stories if we want to gather. We can even have a little theater in our own apartment, in a garage, or even in a storefront. But we have to make sure that we have to empower ourselves by, by actually doing the work ourselves. No one's going to give you the seat at the table. And I can tell you this, sometimes when they give you a seat at the table, you will leave when they tell you to leave and you can eat what you want to eat. You're only empowered when you have the table of your own, invite your own guests and everyone chooses the menu. Ooh, I like, I like, I like all of that. Um, I was like, I want I want to go to that dinner and sit at, and sit at that table. Oh my um, God, it's not Asian American panel unless someone saw talks about food. I know, it's yeah. inevitable. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, Lauren. No, I, I, I feel it for me, just like, I think there, were, there was like a certain point in my career where I was, I was like, I, I, I want to have like a big vision for this. I, I want to, I want to feel, you know, like I'm, I'm worthy of kind of not like the, the base, basement underground 50, 50 seat, you know, space underneath. There's, there's always like great experiences that happen in those. Um, but just feeling like I wanted to write stories that could re just reach literally more people um, that felt like they had some sense of like epicness and spectacle to it, where it's like, it would be really hard to see this in a small space. Like, let's, let's bring it up here. And, you know, like part of that is just greater visibility. Part of that is, you know, the respect it demands. And part of that, you know, is, is that, you know, it's the difference between like a Lord A contract and a Lord B contract. Um, and, and one is much more livable uh, than the other. Um, and this is my last question before I turn it over to the audience, but I feel like we need to note that David's been the only Asian American playwright that's won a Tony award. And since the Tonys just announced their, their uh, 2020 ceremony today, I, I know y'all don't have the answers to this, mm -hmm. but how do we get more, more playwright, Asian playwrights on Broadway? Mm, that's a good question. Cause like by, by my count, it's David, David Rajiv Joseph, Young Jean Lee. Um, Ayad. What was that? Ayad, Ayad oh, Akhtar. Yeah, Ayad. Um, and um, and um, Allegiance. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how do we get? How do we get? Ben, yeah, been on Broadway, not won awards. Yeah. That that's a yeah. the awards thing is a more uh, depressing statistic. Mm. <laughs> I mean, five isn't great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just because I was like, I feel like there's probably more playwrights named David who have been on Broadway. <laughs> Than, than Asians. <laughs> I mean, I, I am hopeful that this next period that we're going into as Broadway reopens, um, that there is, yes, there's been a lot of talk about, you know, sort of racial reckoning, which maybe will have some effect um, and you know there are organizations I think that have been working really hard to to change to to change Broadway when we come back. But there is also the kind of I believe economic reality, and we'll see if this happens. Of course, that it's going to take a while for tourists to come back. And if that's the case, it means that Broadway may have to program more for local audiences the way that like M Butterfly, the original M Butterfly got to Broadway because there just weren't things to put in the theaters. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, Jujamson had to take a risk and put money into M Butterfly at that same, it was Rocco Landisman's first year running it. He also put money into Into the Woods, which doesn't seem like a risk in retrospect, but you have to remember that at that point, Sondheim had never had a commercial hit. 
And so I think it's, it could be a tougher time for theater owners, but maybe more risk is going to have to be taken once more in this next era as New York has to kind of be scrappy and come back again. And that could cre create more opportunities. And you know, there are a small handful of Asian American Broadway producers, commercial producers too, they, we could benefit from more. And this could be an opportunity for them to come up. And to what David is saying, there's a lot of opportunity not to tell those stories because they're looking for programming and looking for work. So aside from artists, sometimes I always feel leaders, leadership and producers can be very, very helpful, instrumental in getting our stories heard. We need to develop that community of artists, um, leaders that way. Yes, we, we all know some crazy rich Asians. Get them to the theater. Um, let's turn it over to our audience. Uh, oh, I love this one. It's a shout out. Uh, can y'all name some AAPI theater artists that you love who deserve more attention? Yes. Who wants to go first? Julia. Oh, sorry, Lauren, go first. Okay. Uh, hey, I was like, Sarah, Sarah Porkolov, I think her like dragon, dragon cycle is amazing. I'm excited to see the end of it. Chris, Christopher Chen, he has a show uh, streaming uh, at American Conservatory Theater, which I'm really excited to see. Um, well, keep, keep going as a- uh, Lloyd Sa mm -hmm. is a fantastic and um, Chinese woman, Chinese lady, Chinese woman. Chinese um, lady. Uh, yeah, was, was fantastic. Haruna Lee. Um, there's, there's so many good ones. It's like, um, light, it's like lightning round. Exactly. <laughs> oh, I was like, uh, I think Mim Mimi Lian's, uh, insta it's not a, it's not a theater set, but it's an installation at Lincoln Center, which is the mm. great giant lawn, which I'm very excited uh, to try out soon. Oh, your kid's gonna love it, Lauren. Yeah. I loved it. And I'm a giant, giant kid. Mm -hmm. I like some of the younger writers too, Yilong Liu, you know, Deepika Guha, whom I really love, and Ray Patmatmat, who's been around, oh, but yeah. he needs to be seen more. You know, Jihei Park is great. And definitely, I, I, I love Chris Chen. So, you know, these are wonderful writers. Aditi Kapel is wonderful too. There are a lot. There are really a lot of writers. And to what David has said too, and Lauren, we need to find more room and more space to give them their opportunity to tell their stories. Yeah. Yeah, just take someone saying yes, just say yes to all of those. Yeah. Right Shout out to Lena Patel too. Yeah. Yes. Oh, this is a great question. Um, what are ways that you all are thinking about alternatives to emphasize certain narratives in AAPI history that aren't just about creating white empathy for the other or that tend to re-traumatize AAPI communities as a way of trauma porn? Hmm. I mean, maybe just to start us off, I was like, I'll, I'll just go back to kind of who are you making this for? Right, you you know everyone can see the show, uh, but kind of whose experience would you like to kind of hold hold up uh, as as like the rubric for like how you how you create this? Um, yeah, I would say in general, I don't think I'm too interested in trauma porn. Uh, I think most of my work has been about trying to take uh, the stories that. Ex to take tropes that exist and see them through a, a different lens. Um, and so that's how I try to do it. Everything to add, Jay, about working about on historical narratives? Because you, you've also directed plays by other, by non-Asian playwrights as well. Yeah, I, I feel that there's a fine line between trauma porn and truth. Mm -hmm. And I really want to see more Asian American history uh, being on our stages too. I think there's a lack of it. And I've always found that my education being an Asian American as an immigrant actually came from the theater and not from schools or classes or anything else. And I wish there were more and I wish there were more um, of a variety as well. I think there are lots of things in our culture as Asian Americans that have not been put on stage. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is a good one from an emerging Asian American commercial theater producer. Um, hey. Yay. Um, do you, uh, they, they say that, she, she says that there are a lot of Asian American professionals who feel, who have money, but feel set, very separated 
very separate from the arts. Uh, do you have any thoughts on how we can continue to, to connect AAPI communities and money to our work rather than just relying on traditional theater investors? I guess, how do we get more Asians to invest in theater? That's a very good question. Um, you know, the, the thing that I find interesting is that it's not like Asians, whether they're wealthy or not wealthy, they everybody agrees that they want to see more representations of people like us and stories about us um, and, you know, in all the different media. So the question becomes, all right, if we all want this, um, the people who happen to have resources to try to make that happen, how do we begin to make that case that this is a good place to put your money, whether it's donating to a not-for-profit or investing in a show, which, you know, probably you're not going to make your money back, although you have a small chance of, becoming, of making a lot of money. Um, and based on that question, I feel like, you know, we really do need to work on that. We need to come up with strategies and uh, pitches and campaigns to connect those two things. Well, I, I think this is a very, um, it's a question I've heard for many, many decades, which is interesting, but I think maybe this is the first time we need to probably address it head on. How do we find a way to make Asian Americans feel that art is important to them, their family, and to the country? I think this is a big, big, I would say, question to figure out. Because I think once there is a connection that these stories are important, so that, for example, if we are undergoing through this um, wave of hate crimes against Asian Americans, it's now become personal. If we tell all these stories, is there a possibility that we can change the way that people look at us so that people's children, Asian Americans' children, will not get hurt and harmed? There may be a way to get them to connect, to commit to financial resources to tell these stories on the bigger commercial stages or also in nonprofit stages. I think this is an opportunity that could be used at this very moment. Yeah, and I feel like it also goes back to the issue of like um, generating audiences and making sure like, like the community knows about the work. And I think, because all, all of you have like worked on, you know, these plays and these BIPOC plays and majority white houses, where you all have to go out and like find the audience. But once you find them, they're willing to come. And so like, what, what do you all think is the, uh, that hurdle that, that needs to be? Um... Yeah. Leadership. Yeah. It's always been leadership. And I think um, the new generation of artistic directors and some at the moment are actually trying to figure out how to actually figure out how to bring more communities into the theater. But we cannot be that one slot that you bring into a season. You have to bring the community to every show. You have to commit to continuing telling Asian American stories or certain kinds of stories. It's a huge commitment. If you kind of just say, we're gonna do this Asian American play for one season and do nothing else for the next three, they're not gonna commit to either coming or actually uh, finding a way to donate to become part of the uh, American theater. I think we need to invest in our audiences deeply and truthfully because a new generation of Asian American theater goers is not impossible. It's a wonderful big dream that could be a reality. And Che ran a theater, he would know. Um, okay, fi final question from a young AAPI playwright. Um, I feel an overwhelming pressure to follow suit of my AAPI predecessors and write Asian-centered stories. How do you feel about Asians tackling stories outside of what may be expected from us? Is there more merit writing Asian-centered stories versus stories that aren't necessarily Asian, but Asian-led? Hmm. I think it's um, important for all writers to write the thing that they're really interested in. Mm -hmm. um, you write from the questions that you have, you write from what you need to explore in yourself, you write from what's unique and weird and different. Now, you may define that in terms of being Asian, or you might not. And either way, it's, it's great, as long as you're following the thing that's most important to you. 
Yeah, and I mean, I I would I would say like, you know, I would say maybe my works still splits 50 50 in terms of like plays that specifically relate to my own identity and 50, the other half of the plays not um you know and for for better or worse you know the the ones that i think you know represent asian americans on stage have been produced more frequently and at bigger at bigger venues you know and partially that's been because it's what may be expected of me and partially because um, that may be what they're kind of the, the gap that they're trying that they're trying to fill or like represent better. Um, you know, but at the end of the day, writing a play is so hard. Um, and it and it and it so many things, you know, can kind of derail it that it's like the only the only thing that should matter at the end of the day is like, are you so obsessed with this work that you're going to see it through to the end no matter like what it's about if it matters to you um it's it's kind of like you know like you're possessed and you're just like this is this is the only thing that kind of my passion will help me carry out um you know and then some and then you're left with the play and you're like okay well what do i do with this now i think that's that's what usually happens right that it that it's hard to like plan exactly the thing that you think is going to be received in the way you want and more of like what things seized me uh, that I now have to figure out what to do with. No, I agree but with both David and Lauren and both great playwrights. But I also want to say to you, um, wonderful emerging playwright, why are you not wanting to write that? Is there um, a fear or is there something that may be complicated in which you do not want to express? I think it could be a great challenge for you to explore that as well. You don't have to, unless you feel compelled to. And I believe that's what David had said. But sometimes diving into something into your life is probably a wonderful way of opening doors into the way that you look at the world too. Um, you don't have to take this advice and that's, that's really cool. But I just wondered if that could also be an option instead of a closed door. Yeah, I think right what scares you is a, um, I think that's a Paula Vogel uh, lesson. I think that's a Young Jean Lee thing like, too. Oh, yeah. Yeah. oh yes, Young Jean Lee. Ah, thank you for that. Um, oh, okay, and also writing a play is hard, understatement of the year. Thank you, Lauren. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, so thank you, Lauren, David, Che, for this amazing conversation and for taking the time. Uh, thank you, Signature, for hosting. Uh, our hour is up and a happy AIPI Heritage Month, everyone. I feel like it's been a, a tougher one than years past, but I'm glad we're all sharing it together. And thank you, Deep. Yes. Thank yeah, thank you, Deep. Thank you, actors, yeah. too. Yes. Thank you, actors.